So hello, Naval War College colleagues, and welcome to this lecture of opportunity, or Lou, about China and climate change. My name is Commander Andrea Cameron, and I coordinate the human or Climate and Human Security Studies Group at the Naval War College. For those of you who don't know about the group, it is composed of faculty, staff, and students interested in engaging on non-traditional and transnational security threats. In addition to climate security issues, we also look at human security topics like food insecurity, water scarcity, health insecurity, economic development, migration, and the resultant humanitarian crises. If you'd like to join the group, please put your email in the chat or you can email me directly at andrea.cameron at usnwc.edu. This lecture of opportunity kicks off a great year of lectures, courses, and events. Just to give you a heads up, we will be hosting a Human Security in the Maritime Environment Conference on October 28th and 29th. And this conference explores the intersecting strategic implications that happen in the maritime environment, which navies would be particularly interested about. So we'll be talking about IUU fishing, illicit trafficking in modern slavery, piracy and armed robbery, cultural heritage protection, and how all of these interact with the lives and livelihoods of people ashore. Also on January 14th, 2022, we'll be hosting the National Security Significance of a Changing Climate Conference. And this year's version will have the theme Operationalizing Climate Security. And finally, keep watching the Lou calendar for other great talks coming your way. <laughs> Today, we host Dr. Scott Moore. He's a researcher and policymaker focused on emerging environmental and technological challenges. Dr. Moore is currently Director of China Programs and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania, where he works with the faculty across the university to design and conduct research on emerging challenges facing China and the world, including climate change, artificial intelligence, and gene editing. Dr. Moore's own research focuses on environmental politics and policy, especially water resources. Dr. Moore was previously the Water Resources Management Specialist at the World Bank Group's Water Global Practice and served as the Environment Science Technology and Health Officer for China at the U.S. Department of State. In this capacity, he was responsible for developing and coordinating all aspects of the U.S.-China environmental cooperation and worked extensively on the Paris Agreement on climate change, as well as ocean conservation and civil space cooperation. Dr. Moore's research and commentary is widely published, including his first book, Subnational Hydropolitics, Conflict, Cooperation, and Institution Building in Shared River Basins. And that book examined how climate change and other pre pressures affect the likelihood of conflict over water within countries. And his new book on China's role in global public goods issues in the context of great power competition is due to be released, released later next year. Dr. Moore holds a master's and doctoral degrees from Oxford University and an undergraduate degree from Princeton. We are honored to have Scott join us today, bringing together two of the biggest concerns within the Department of Defense, China and climate change. For those watching, the presentation will be recorded, but we will stop the recording at the end and open the floor for questions from the audience. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. You have your screen shared already, and I invite you to start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Andrea, uh, and I appreciate that uh, that generous introduction, but uh, the honor is, is mine. Uh, I thank you all for joining uh, me today. Uh, I want to say, and actually, I don't think I mentioned this to Andrea as we were corresponding about setting up today's talk, but uh, I had the chance to, um, uh, to pass by uh, the Naval War College a couple of weeks ago. I was up in Bristol, Rhode Island, um, a couple of towns north. Uh, of Newport, and I got to see the college from the sea, um, as I suppose it is meant to be seen in some ways, uh, but I hope uh, one day I uh, have the chance to visit and uh, meet uh, some of you in, uh, in person. Uh, also, I uh, just want to uh, say that uh, thinking of everyone who may have been affected by uh, Tropical Storm uh, Henry, as I, uh, you may have heard me say uh, on a couple minutes early, um, certainly thinking about everyone who was affected by that, hoping that if you do uh, if you did lose power uh, that you, uh, uh, in your home, presumably you have it somewhere if you're logged on, but um, that you get it back uh, soon. Uh, 
Um, so I just want to kind of start, and, and we'll, uh, as Andrea kind of mentioned, we'll, we'll try to focus a little bit on uh, some of the, the national security and economic competitiveness uh, dimension uh, of uh, China's relationship with climate change. But I wanted to just sort of start by flagging um, uh, just sort of the, the wider context um, in which you talk about climate change period um, uh, in light of the IPCC sixth assessment report, um, the part of which was uh, was released a couple of weeks ago, as many of you may have seen. Um, a couple of uh, key takeaways from uh, that report, basically the situation is pretty dire, um, but at the same time, uh, the evidence has been strengthened um, that whatever we can do, we absolutely should do as quickly as possible, um, because every degree uh, Celsius of warming that you uh, can prevent uh, or can avert uh, does have a measurable impact on all of the things that we're really concerned about um, when it comes to climate change. Um, and it's something that uh, you know Andrea has been closely involved in, um, along with uh, many others in the Department of Defense over the last uh, six months or so, uh, has been thinking about uh, uh, a number of those effects as they relate to uh, climate change uh, and uh, national security and international security. And that's something we can come um, back to, but uh, briefly, uh, that uh, includes um, the prospect of a significantly increased out-migration from, uh, from certain uh, areas, uh, political instability uh, as a result of food, water, and other uh, climate-linked environmental stresses, uh, and not least uh, extreme uh, weather events, um, which we'll come back to because uh, that's one of the more significant kind of climate and security uh, nexus issues when it comes to China. Uh, also, just to kind of uh, set the stage, um, there are really two uh, fundamental kind of features of China's uh, role and contribution to uh, the global climate change issue. This graph um, will show you both of those. Um, the first uh, feature is that historically, uh, China accounted for uh, a pretty small portion um, of total greenhouse gas emissions, and this would be roughly um, the same if you were looking at total greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, over kind of the, the period since the Industrial Revolution as well. Um, but so a relatively small uh, proportion, but since the early 2000s, since around 2005, has been the largest single emitter. Um, and uh, as a kind of side note uh, to that, um, you can kind of see that as we get over to the, um, the uh, right hand uh, uh, kind of most recent part of the graph there, um, the interesting thing that you start to see is that although um, the uh, Western industrialized countries uh, do still account for the majority of historical emissions, um, we're kind of starting to get close um, to that evening out, um, even when you look historically and in large part because of uh, the growth in China's emissions, uh, to some extent also uh, uh, emissions increases from other Asian countries, uh, India, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the kind of takeaways here are one uh, from a kind of total historical uh, perspective. Um, it's the Western industrialized countries that are responsible for most of the emissions. Um, but for the last uh, 15 years or so, China has been the single largest emitter. Um, and the size of that emissions uh, uh, contribution is, in fact, so large um, that you're getting close to balancing out that historical uh, imbalance or asymmetry. Uh, to be fair, another way to look at uh, China's contribution to global climate change is on a per capita uh, basis. Um, and, when, and certainly that's a point that China uh, often has made in, in international climate negotiations, less so recently, um, but certainly historically has. Um, and I think, you know, with some good reason, um, it is helpful to kind of uh, uh, switch to a per capita uh, perspective um, when it comes to contribution to global uh, emissions. This is just CO2, although again, it's you know, roughly um, kind of indicative of total uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, but of course, uh, US per capita emissions uh, are far higher. Uh, they're uh, almost twice, uh, twice as much as uh, Chinese per capita emissions. Um, it does bear uh, being said that the US is not necessarily the worst offender. Uh, Canadian uh, per capita emissions are actually higher. Um, and certainly uh, the highest are uh, tend to be uh, Gulf states and, uh, and uh, oil producing states. The U.S. isn't the worst offender, um, but still has per capita emissions that are roughly tw uh, twice those of uh, China. Uh, China, in turn, uh, has emissions that are lower even than Japan, um, which is a, a pretty energy efficient uh, industrialized economy. Um, one of the 
two or three most energy efficient uh, industrialized economies. Um, but sort of on the flip side of the coin um, of kind of saying that China's per capita emissions are, are considerably lower than most industrialized countries, they're also far, far higher than most other developing countries. I mean, you can see at the bottom of that graph there, uh, per capita emission for India. Uh, and, you know, just to take one example of a, 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 of a, of a one of the least developed countries, Afghanistan, um, and you can see the, the gap between China and those less developed um, and developing countries. So China sort of fits in a, a, a sort of almost unique in-between uh, category uh, in terms of its contribution to emissions, where uh, it's an extremely large, it's the largest uh, uh, total emitter, uh, and also a fairly uh, uh, fairly large, but still kind of middling overall um, per capita greenhouse gas. And I think this kind of helps to frame um, thinking about uh, China's uh, contribution to reducing emissions, um, both in terms of kind of what's fair and maybe what's just even, um, but also in terms of uh, the politics that are at play um, in thinking about where are these relative per capita uh, contributions. Um, now switching back to thinking about kind of driving uh, forces, what drives uh, China's climate and energy policy. Um, and I think a lot of it is uh, shown in this, uh, this graph here. And, and what you see uh, here, uh, uh, it's about 30 years of, uh, uh, of evolution of China's uh, energy supply. Um, this is basically also capturing uh, the rise of China. Um, certainly, uh, uh, China's kind of uh, growth trajectory really started to take off um, beginning in uh, the mid to late 90s, um, received huge boots uh, in 2001 with accession to the World Trade Organization. So really what you're seeing here is the rise of, uh, of, the rise of China. Um, and what you can see pretty clearly from this graph is that that rise has been almost entirely powered um, by fossil fuels. Um, especially coal, um, which is that light blue uh, uh, portion at the top of the graph, um, but also pretty significantly oil um, at the bottom of the graph. Um, and that uh, oil, that, that growth in, uh, in oil as a part of China's total energy uh, supply, it's significant because China is not a, uh, a major oil producer. It does have some domestic supply, um, but it's not a very significant producer. Uh, and that means um, that over the same time period, uh, China developed a pretty significant um, uh, oil uh, energy insecurity problem. Uh, and in fact, I think you could make the argument that uh, a decent uh, chunk of China's major foreign policy uh, initiatives uh, over the last 20 to 25 years, um, including the Belt and Road, um, has been at least in part uh, a response to this uh, fundamental energy insecurity when it comes to uh, the supply of oil, in particular being very dependent um, on seaborne uh, uh, transportation, from, primarily from the uh, Gulf uh, region, to a lesser extent, uh, some parts of Southeast Asia, um, for, that, uh, for that oil supply that is easily disrupted, uh, whether it is from uh, terrorism or political instability, or hypothetically uh, in a, uh, a conflict uh, by a foreign adversary, not the, uh, the United States. Um, so I think what this kind of graph uh, helps us to kind of uh, understand is just how fundamental uh, growth in fossil fuels has been to China's overall economic rise uh, and why um, uh, the dominant kind of uh, consideration in thinking about climate change as an issue um, has been how to kind of balance um, this dependence um, on, uh, on fossil fuels uh, with uh, trying to uh, achieve uh, environmental uh, objectives, as well as, uh, to some degree, diplomatic ones. Something we can maybe talk about is of interest um, is the role that climate change played in China's public diplomacy uh, and its sort of influence-building campaign on the international. Really the global governance issue uh, on which China has kind of coalesced um, as a, uh, an area in which it wants to be uh, seen and portrayed as a responsible uh, global stakeholder. Though, again, as we can get into, um, and as we'll we'll see in a couple minutes, um, you know, somewhat uh, often exaggerated in terms of uh, its total contribution to uh, solving the problem. Another uh, important way of, of thinking about China's kind of uh, motivations and it, the sort of drivers of its uh, of its stance on on climate and energy policy is just to think about economic structure. Um, China is uh, a very uh, heavily industrialized country. Um, and this graph shows uh, kind of two ways of looking at that. One is 
manufacturing as a percentage of total national output, meaning your the sort of total um, GDP value of the economy. Um, that's the orange bar. And then the gray bar is um, that country's uh, manufacturing sector as a percentage of total, uh, total global manufacturing uh, sector. Uh, and what kind of uh, stands out about China um, is that not only uh, does manufacturing in the country account for a very portion uh, of, the, uh, of the economy, about a third, um, but it also accounts for uh, the single uh, uh, greatest concentration of the global manufacturing sector. That's different from really all other industrialized countries. You do have other countries where manufacturing is a substantial part of the economy, like Germany, South Korea, um, but they're a, a, a considerably smaller fraction uh, of the total uh, industrial sector. So what this is telling us um, is that not only is industry uh, really important to China's economy, um, but China's industrial sector is extremely important uh, to the global sector overall. Um, this links to climate change simply because industry um, is uh, probably the largest single uh, portion of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how you count um, electricity uh, and power generation. But it's probably the largest single uh, uh, single driver, uh, certainly carbon dioxide uh, in the um, which is another way of saying that China's uh, contribution to climate change is in large part a reflection of its economic structure, um, which is heavily dependent on uh, industry. Uh, and more, more so even than that is particularly dependent on heavy, very carbon intensive sectors like steel manufacture, cement uh, production, et cetera. Uh, another uh, final kind of point on uh, uh, economic and industrial structure um, is that historically speaking, uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese industrial sector uh, and Chinese industrial uh, uh, concerns uh, are, uh, were pretty inefficient by global standards, meaning that they did not have the latest uh, equipment. Um, they produced relatively little uh, in terms of energy inputs. So for a ton of coal that was burned, um, most other countries' competitors would have been able to do more um, with that ton of coal uh, than most Chinese firms. Uh, that kind of gap has been um, uh, improving uh, in recent years, but it's still persists. And so what you see is uh, uh, China as a, as a country um, that is uh, uh, dependent on this pretty inefficient, relatively inefficient, um, very kind of uh, uh, heavy industri industry dominated um, and pretty heavily polluting uh, economic uh, model. And that's in large part why you see uh, China's contribution to uh, the climate change problem uh, be in overall. Uh, another kind of way of looking at this um, uh, is uh, uh, in terms of um, the change in emissions, uh, both uh, in terms of production and consumption. So one aspect of China being so heavy and uh, so heavily industrialized, if one reason it's so uh, heavily industrialized, uh, is uh, the export-led growth model. This is really what probably the single biggest driver of China's uh, rise uh, over the last 30 years uh, has been this model where uh, China produces uh, goods and then exports them to the rest uh, of the world in exchange uh, gets uh, significant quantities of foreign direct investment uh, and, uh, uh, and inflows of foreign currency that it then uses to, uh, uh, to develop its own economy um, and very, uh, especially in including infrastructure investment. Um, that's kind of what's known as workshop, uh, when people call China the workshop of the world, they're really referring to that export-led uh, uh, economic growth model. Um, certainly that's resulted in a very significant uh, increase in, uh, in GDP per capita, which is the top line of the graph here. Um, but for our purposes and thinking about China's contribution to climate change, another aspect um, is that there is a uh, relatively small, but nonetheless uh, meaningful percentage of China's emissions um, that is actually uh, generated by export. Um, now, one arguable way to look at this um, is that some uh, significant fraction of, uh, of the rest of the world's emissions, particularly um, the Western industrialized countries, emissions, have been effectively outsourced to China um, because uh, th these emissions are being generated in the production of goods that are then um, exported to the West. Um, again, not a not a terribly significant uh, chunk of uh, China's total emission, um, but it is meaningful, and I think it is uh, uh, worth keeping in mind in thinking about uh, China's kind of responsibility um, as part of the global climate change uh, problem. And you can see the production-based uh, 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 CO2 per capita calculation um, is the green line um, 
uh, on top, but towards the bottom uh, part of the, of the graph there. Uh, and then consumption-based CO2, which is purely domestic um, uh, emissions, essentially. Uh, it's on, so there is that um, that gap and that feature of China's economic model and its relationship to China's overall uh, green gas emissions. Um, all this being said, um, despite China's uh, kind of status as the world's largest emitter and the, the kind of fundamental uh, and systemic reasons that it's the, the largest uh, emitter, uh, again, stemming from that industrial structure, that, that support-led uh, economic model. Uh, nonetheless, uh, China has been uh, decreasing the uh, overall contribution of fossil fuels to its energy mix. Uh, this graph shows uh, the share of primary energy coming from fossil fuels. So again, principally coal and oil, um, but also uh, uh, natural gas and some other, uh, other less uh, significant fossil fuels. Um, and you can see that that uh, share has been falling over time. It was essentially 100% um, prior to uh, uh, 15 years ago or so. Then started to slowly decrease. But since uh, around 2015, um, we have started to see a significant decrease. Uh, and a lot of this uh, is driven by policy. Most of this decrease is driven by China's climate and energy policy. Um, principally, um, a couple of things. Uh, one are uh, a range of uh, policy supports given to uh, renewable energy. Um, so initially, those were uh, more or less uh, direct subsidies, um, including uh, guaranteed preferential uh, uh, rates that were, were given power generated from renewable sources. Um, a lot of those subsidies have fairly recently been phased out, um, but there's still pretty significant policy support that exists to favor renewables, especially wind and solar. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, there's been a kind of whole series of measures geared toward trying to improve uh, the efficiency of uh, China's, uh, uh, especially energy, uh, I'm sorry, especially industrial sector uh, through things like targets that mandate uh, a certain um, uh, energy intensity, meaning, or, or a certain carbon intensity, meaning that for every uh, unit of CO2 that's emitted or, uh, uh, or uh, unit of energy that's consumed, uh, you have to kind of produce uh, a certain value per GDP, just a measure of efficiency. Uh, but that does help to bend um, the emission curve uh, and does help to uh, decrease the, the share of fossil fuels in China's overall energy mix. So suffice it to say, um, we do see a meaningful kind of improvement here um, over the last particularly um, five to 10 years. And a lot of that is driven um, by policy that has uh, helped to bend the curve in terms of share of fossil fuels energy mix, uh, and therefore uh, contribution. Nonetheless, um, carbon is a pretty huff, uh, tough habit to kick, uh, and it's worth kind of focusing in on um, kind of a current snapshot of what China's energy mix looks like, um, just to drive home the point that although the trend is positive, uh, China's emissions are still rising, and it's also maybe worth emphasizing from this graph this isn't emission. This is just the share of fossil fuels in the total energy mix. So although it does translate into emission, um, that's not the same thing as saying that China's emissions um, have in fact decreased. Um, they have not on an absolute basis continued to rise um, and uh, uh, currently are expected to do so um, for about the next five years or so. Um, and a big part of why is uh, because of the inertia um, that results from this type of energy roughly 60% coal, um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, actually another kind of uh, important thing to keep in mind um, in thinking about total energy mix is that even when we kind of shift over to the renewable side of the equation, um, hydro is the biggest single chunk of it. If you take hydro out of the equation, you're really only looking at about 5%, uh, you know, sort of truly clean uh, or environmentally friendly uh, wind and solar power. Um, you know, still a very uh, small portion of China's overall energy mix. Uh, another thing that's worth kind of pointing out about this current um, part of the picture is that 20% um, petroleum and other uh, fossil fuel, li liquefied fossil fuels, essentially. Um, that's a particularly tough um, slice of the pie to shrink because that's primarily um, your transport uh, applications. That's your uh, vehicles. Um, that's your, uh, your aviation, uh, your domestic aviation sector anyway, um, your domestic shipping sector. That's a particularly difficult um, uh, fuel to replace. 
um, simply because at the moment we don't have a great uh, substitute or alternative for the energy density that oil provides. That's really important um, when you're talking about moving, whether it's ship vehicles um, or aircraft. So that 20% um, is going to be particularly hard um, to tackle. And we'll come back to that briefly. Uh, um, now I want to shift into just talking a little bit about uh, China's choices going, uh, uh, going forward. Um, and for the next couple of slides, I want to make clear, I'm actually borrowing slides from a presentation um, that a, a senior uh, Tsinghua University professor gave last year, uh, I believe it was last October. Um, and uh, I don't uh, uh, kind of include them here because I think you should necessarily take them as gospel. Um, but it's, uh, uh, as far as I know, the most kind of authoritative, uh, presents the most authoritative kind of um, uh, outline. Um, for China's uh, policy choices going forward um, when it comes to its climate and energy uh, uh, targets. Um, and in particular, this presentation was made to try to outline specifically how China might achieve the pledge that uh, Xi Jinping laid out uh, in a speech to the UN General Assembly uh, a year ago, essentially committing China to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2060. Um, that, um, it's worth emphasizing, is uh, the most ambitious uh, climate policy that China has announced. It's also the most ambitious uh, climate policy that any developing country has committed to. Um, so it shouldn't be under, uh, kind of understated or uh, under uh, emphasized in terms of its, its importance. Um, but what the next few slides are going to um, emphasize for us, uh, and again, just sort of you know, not uh, as gospel, but just indicatively, is it's going to be a very, very difficult target to meet. Uh, and even if uh, China does manage to meet it, it may in fact be too little too late uh, in terms of the climate overall. Um, so this particular slide shows a couple of different uh, uh, emissions uh, and policy scenarios, or rather the uh, effects on emissions of several different policy scenarios. Um, the kind of light blue dashed line that you see um, at the top there, the top line, is essentially business as usual based on current policy. Um, the uh, uh, orange uh, line here is essentially kind of a, a more ambitious um, set of, uh, of policies, kind of making existing policy more stringent, if you will. Um, and then the lower two uh, uh, trajectories here are what would be needed uh, in order uh, for China's contributions uh, or what China would need to do to uh, keep global temperature increase under two degrees or uh, within two degrees, uh, the lower uh, line there is uh, 1.5 degree target. Uh, and then this uh, portion, the sort of red portion in the middle here um, is uh, what would be uh, consistent with that 2050 uh, uh, kind of target overall. And then a more uh, kind of general long-term low carbon transition scenario. That, that isn't very well defined in this presentation. But the kind of takeaways here um, are that, uh, one, the uh, 2050 pledge uh, scenario um, is probably consistent with the two degree target, um, definitely not consistent with the uh, 1.5 degree target, which the IPCC report makes a pretty good case is what we really need to be aiming for. Uh, and even that, even the 2050 uh, kind of uh, uh, decarbonization scenario, that two degree target are considerably more ambitious um, than uh, what we would be getting if we're uh, on current Chinese policy trajectory or even an enhanced version of that. Um, so this is going to be um, a, a pretty uh, tough act uh, to, uh, uh, to, to affect. Another thing that's important to uh, keep in mind about these scenarios, and again, just sort of thinking about whether our, our uh, uh, objective is 2 degrees or 1.5, and the IPCC report, again, makes a pretty strong case that it should be 1.5, um, is just how uh, significant uh, the additional emissions uh, uh, cuts would have to be in China to get to that 1.5 degree target. Um, the orange bars in the center of this graph here show um, one sort of breakdown of, of what you would need to get uh, to that level of emissions. I mean, there are a couple of things that are worth uh, pointing out here. Um, one is that there's a pretty significant uh, amount of carbon capture and storage that's needed. Um, this is a technology that is pretty well understood in terms of fundamentals, um, but is not at, at present commercially feasible. Um, so you're talking about at least one major new technology um, that you need to deploy uh, in order to make the scenario feasible. 
Um, you'll also see in the text at the bottom here, they make quite a bit of reference to hydrogen. Um, and that uh, is um, what you would need to, uh, to achieve these uh, emissions reductions in sectors like industry. Um, carbon, is, or, I'm sorry, hydrogen uh, is probably one of the, uh, uh, the key kind of uh, 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 new technologies or new processes that you would need to carbonize steel for um, probably need hydrogen fuel uh, to, to do that in a low carbon scenario. So this is all to say um, that uh, all of these, whether it's a two degree or a 1.5 degree target that we're shooting for, um, it's a significant uh, lift for China, um, but that difference between 1.5 and two is especially difficult. Um, and we do still see a significant gap uh, in terms of what the modeling shows is, uh, uh, is necessary for 1.5 versus two, uh, which again is kind of what we think we need to avert um, a climate catastrophe. Also worth uh, emphasizing, though probably uh, kind of implicit from uh, some of these earlier slides, this is gonna be expensive um, for China. Um, and I mean, it would be expensive for, for all countries. Um, and here it's worth keeping in mind that China's uh, 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 gross national income per capita is still lower than Mexico. Um, and if you think about it in, in this context, you look at this graph, which shows the cost of following some of these different scenarios um, certainly the cost differential between uh, achieving that 1.5 degree scenario um, and achieving kind of the business as usual scenario is extremely significant. The other thing that's worth keeping in mind um, is that the costs are essentially upfront. Uh, and here is where political economy kind of comes in. You think about any really heavy lift, um, any really difficult long-term policy, um, this is not what you, this is not what you want to see. Um, because it makes uh, the people who are going to have to bear the costs of uh, that transition uh, gives them that much more reason to oppose it up front. Um, whereas if you can find a way of uh, distributing the costs more toward the, uh, more toward the, the long term, uh, that can help uh, to lower the barriers to, uh, to uh, adoption of an ambitious policy. But unfortunately, um, all of these decarbonization scenarios are the exact opposite. Um, and frankly, I think it's good reason uh, to believe that uh, China may have quite a bit of difficulty um, in achieving uh, more ambitious policy targets than it's already uh, announced, even though the science is again telling us um, that that's exactly what we need, much more ambitious action from China and other countries uh, in order to avert climate uh, catastrophe. Uh, and my kind of evidence for this, um, and admittedly it's early to tell, um, but so far, what we see in terms of China's uh, more near and medium term policy targets is essentially kicking the can uh, down the road. Um, so two kind of halves to this uh, to this graph on the, the left hand side, uh, you see planned versus actual uh, targets for energy and carbon intensity under the last uh, five year plan, the 13th five year plan here. Um, and what you can see is that both uh, energy and carbon intensity targets uh, were modestly modestly underperformed uh, the goal. Um, that in itself is uh, is a little bit concerning, um, but more concerning than that is apparently the uh, response to that in the 14th five-year plan, which is shown over on the right-hand side, is to make both sets of targets less ambitious. Um, and you can see uh, uh, on the kind of third set of bars there, um, this is what uh, was actually uh, recommended uh, uh, by uh, the gentleman uh, uh, in terms of targets that would that would put us on uh, more of a close something close to that two degree uh, Celsius target, um, but the actual uh, plan targets that were uh, were set in the plan are uh, less ambitious than that. Um, that's not what we want to see um, if our uh, objective is decarbonization. Um, that is maybe what we would expect to see. Um, if we're thinking more in terms of politics than economics and thinking about how you're going to uh, convince people um, to bear um, these, these high upfront costs. Um, unfortunately, I think we can probably uh, expect this tendency to kick the can uh, to continue. Uh, after all, uh, China may be an authoritarian country, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have politics and it doesn't mean it doesn't have political economy. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, China continues to invest uh, substantial uh, sums in uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, both at home and abroad. 
uh, the abroad kind of portion has gotten, of course, the most attention, and it is worth uh, just kind of pausing on and emphasizing. Uh, just how much uh, of China's overseas energy investment does go to fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, this shows just sort of one slice of that, um, but it is a pretty good data set um, for those of you who may be interested in this run by um, BU. Uh, it only shows uh, financing from two of two sort of Chinese sources, so it's not a complete uh, picture, but it is uh, uh, indicative of the fact um, that it's really only a very small portion uh, of China's overseas energy investment that goes in um, renewable or what we really call clean energy technology. Um, the vast majority of it goes to oil, coal, uh, or LNG, um, substantial hydropower, which uh, is renewable, but tends to be pretty environmentally uh, destructive. Also a substantial uh, uh, nuclear portion. And, um, we can certainly come back to this in Q&A if people are interested, but it is worth emphasizing that China at the moment um, is the world leader in nuclear energy uh, technology, simply the scale of investment in new nuclear plants have about uh, uh, 30 or so nuclear plants um, that are uh, in different stages of planning construction or um, approval um, far and away uh, the largest kind of fleet in the world one wild card um, uh, in thinking about where china is headed and, and i've presented of course a pretty skeptical view um, of uh, of where uh, china's policy is headed on climate and energy one wild card is uh, extreme weather um, this was covered in um, the press. Some of you may have seen this. Um, so this was the second summer in a row in which central China suffered uh, really devastating flood. Last summer, it was uh, kind of Wuhan and the um, uh, and uh, kind of uh, the disaster was sort of centered on uh, Hubei province. Uh, this uh, summer, it was centered on Henan uh, and on particularly the city of, of Zhengzhou. Uh, and these are pictures from the Zhengzhou subway. Um, that was flooded. Uh, several people were killed in this incident. Um, about 300 people were killed overall. Um, pretty quickly um, uh, kind of obfuscated by state media with some censorship, even more uh, kind of misdirection um, that this was, you know, kind of a freak uh, thousand year flood disaster when in fact this is exactly what we can expect um, to happen more and more frequently. Uh, as a result of climate change. And it, it's worth just sort of pointing out, we can come back to this again later. Um, among large countries, China is one of the most heavily impacted um, by climate-linked extreme weather. A uh, large part of that is because of the uh, Himalayan plateau and the uh, high rates of warming uh, that are being experienced on that um, plateau, the sort of downstream uh, significance of that. But it is possible um, that if we see this acceleration in extreme weather events, uh, it could have uh, some type of impact on climate and energy policy. Um, though, if I had to bet, um, based on recent experience, I would say it's probably unlikely. But I do think it is um, a wild card um, that could be significant. Um, last slide um, uh, is uh, just to kind of say, I think what all this adds up to, in my uh, mind at least, is a case for um, skepticism and realism about how uh, quickly and completely China can uh, decarbonize its economy. I think there's a bit of a tendency uh, in the West, uh, particularly in the media and kind of among uh, the environmental community uh, to almost uh, laud uh, China's ability to uh, do things quickly and at scale. Uh, and indeed, uh, China's capacity to mobilize resources uh, does in many ways outstrip uh, our own. Uh, in large part because of uh, you know, the authoritarian nature of the country, uh, the way in which the state is tied to a lot of uh, enterprises and things like that. That's true, um, but I don't think it necessarily follows that China is going to, we can really count on China to lead global decarbonization. Um, in fact, I think uh, the story uh, is much more likely to be uh, that uh, uh, the West and particularly the United States is going to have to shoulder uh, uh, even more um, of the cost and effort and resources required to affect uh, that global decarbonization. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, we have a lot of the kind of pieces um, that uh, of the puzzle that will be required uh, to decarbonize and to sort of solve the climate problem, but we don't necessarily have um, all of the technology. Uh, we need, I think, a lot more investment uh, in particular technology areas, particularly in uh, decarbonizing the transport sector, finding an, an alternative to uh, oil. Uh, 
Uh, and I think the U.S. Um, actually has the biggest single role to play uh, in particularly that clean tech uh, R&D. Uh, and, but I think the other side of that equation, even though I think that if the U.S. is going to have to bear most of the burden, uh, I do think there's considerable opportunity that comes with that. Um, and this graph uh, is kind of my attempt to, to make that case. Um, it's a graph of uh, the export value um, attached to uh, solar, uh, essentially to solar energy, to solar panel uh, manufacturer. Um, and there are two things I think are notable uh, about this. First of all, uh, the value that the U.S. Uh, receives in terms of exports uh, of solar uh, 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 panels is just orders of magnitude higher than any other country, including China. Uh, and moreover, uh, the U.S. is uh, the only major country uh, uh, not to have uh, experienced consistent decrease uh, in the export value of solar PV technology. So I do think there's considerable economic opportunity for the United States uh, in seizing the leadership kind of role in, uh, in developing this next generation of clean technology uh, and in leading uh, the response to global climate change uh, problem more generally. Um, I'm going to stop there, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to uh, some questions and, and some discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Before closing the presentation, I'd like to ask you one question. Uh, the students watching today are our future leaders, and do you have any advice that you could give them regarding how they think about China and climate change in their future positions? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, I think there are several kind of uh, levels, I guess, to um, uh, to that uh, question. I mean, you know, I do think the climate change is sort of like the ultimate existential um, uh, problem, and it's uh, it, it, it's you know very easy to feel uh, to feel hopeless uh, about it. But I think I would kind of, um, in many ways, go back to that um, to that first. Uh, slide from the IPCC just demonstrating that um, every little bit uh, helps. Um, and so I think it's trying to just sort of think about whatever position uh, you may be in, there is a way uh, to contribute to, uh, to the solution. And I think particularly for um, folks in the, the security and, and, uh, uh, and military sectors, um, I think there are, um, there's kind of a unique opportunity in several respects. Um, one, I think, uh, as I mentioned, um, we do need more uh, research and development uh, of clean technology. I think we're going to need at least one more generation of technology, maybe two, uh, to get to the point where we can uh, successfully decarbonize. Um, the military uh, and you know national security actors more generally have a very distinguished history, uh, of course, in the United States of uh, promoting uh, some breakthrough innovations. Um, so I think the extent to which uh, we can sort of work with uh, our national security agencies, uh, the military to develop technologies that are applicable. Um, and I mean, in some ways, the, uh, the, the application is quite correct. So, you know, if you think about trying to um, uh, strip out the dependence of expeditionary forces on fossil fuels um, through uh, renewables, through uh, enhanced battery technology, um, that would actually be a really substantial part um, of the climate change puzzle, but it also meets uh, a really pressing uh, military operational objective. Um, so I think there are a lot of, uh, uh, of technological solutions. I also think just generally making the case for the public, um, you know, as compelling, I think, as the science uh, on climate change uh, is, um, I think uh, it's still not well understood uh, just how much climate change is going to change uh, the way that we live. Uh, and I think is really going to enhance a lot of the threats um, that we face as a country and as a world. And I think um, if we have uh, military leaders, national security leaders who consistently and publicly make that case, um, it will help to build support for the, the kind of dramatic action. Excellent, thank you. So on behalf of the whole Naval War College community, I'd like to thank Dr. Scott Moore so much for sharing his expertise with us today. This concludes the recorded portion of this lecture.